Joining us live is Taiwo Akinlami, who is a child rights activist. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. All right, straight up, um, what do you make of the increasing uh, cases of rape of minors, especially by their caregivers? Uh, okay, uh, let, let me first start by saying that um, I listened to the police report, and I think that there's a level of misconception which emboldens the abuser. Any, any type of sexual contact with a child constitutes an abuse because a child doesn't have capacity to give consent. So, um, and a child is anybody below 18. Even if that child has said, Daddy, come, come, come and have me, it will still be wrong because a child's consent is to be taken as no consent. A child doesn't have capacity to give consent. Between two children, anybody below 18, they can't say, they are conceptual their children having sex uh, as boyfriends and girlfriends. The law frowns at all of those things. So it is important to note that any form of sexual contact with a child, sexual virtues, grooming, is constitutes an abuse. So, so, so I think it's, it's, it's sexual molestation is, uh, uh, is, is uh, uh, sexual abuse. And so, so, so it's important that we identify, we, we say that. Now, the number one thing is this. Now, the, 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 this case is a case of a father who has sexually molested the daughter. Now, even if the daughter has not gotten pregnant, it will have still been molestation. So now, the, the reason why we are seeing increase in this case is because we are not investing in prevention. Now, this ever said that prevention Costs less uh, uh, when you respond to sexual abuse. It is four times more expensive than investing in uh, in um, in um, in uh, abuse. In, in, in investing in uh, response is cheaper to to prevent and to respond. So look at this matter that has gone. The question is who is the watchdog? Who watches over a child? Now, if a child is living with the father. Who can the child talk to? In the school that the child goes to, she goes to school. Who talks about these issues? In the, in the faith-based organization that this child goes to, if she goes to one, who talks about this thing? In the neighborhood, CDAs, do they discuss all of these matters? Because if these things are not being discussed, if efforts are not, if efforts are not being made in terms, in the area of prevention, we are just going to continue to have cases and will just be crying after the evil has been done. So with cases like this, this is not the first time. This is just the one that seems to have been captured on camera for all of us to see. A lot of newspaper reports these days have incest, particularly um, on the increase. What kind of penalty do you think will be a better deterrent for parents who engage in this very unholy act? But deterrence is, is one thing. Um, there, are, there are recommendations in the law. Uh, there's life imprisonment, 14 years. If uh, you do not achieve penetration, life imprisonment under the Child Rights Act. For example, in Lagos State, it is also life imprisonment. Um, the, the law has been amended since 2015 to take charge of all of those things. But this is the point. When you are talking about deterrence, so the people now, for example, in Lagos State, cases have been tried to conclusion. Now, that has a way of deterring people. But you see, as a social development lawyer, I have come to understand that the best form of deterrence is prevention. What do we begin to do to ensure, since we now know that fathers do sexually molest their children, what level of advocacy, what level of, of enlightenment are we involved in? Because enlightenment is brought to enforcement. Whether we like it or not, there was a way we won, we fought and won the war against HIV. There was information, there was advocacy, there was radio jingle. I have not seen that kind of awareness. Talking to you about how HIV can be contacted, talking to you about what you can do to protect yourself, though there was no cure, but people were protected because it became a massive, there was a massive campaign behind it. So until we stop paying lip service to this issue, 
And until it stops becoming news, when something like this happens, situations like this, there has to be massive, massive, massive level of environment, uh, uh, sorry, awareness, funded by government, funded by NGO, supported by individuals, supported by the media. That is the only way I think we can minimize this matter. What will advocacy do? Advocacy will encourage people to speak up. You know, in labor states, there's a mandatory reporting law, uh, uh, executive order, for to the child's right law of labor states, promulgated in 2014, which says that everybody in labor state is a mandatory reporter Taiwo. of any kind of abuse against children, including sexual abuse. The law also goes forward to say, goes forward to say that your identity will be shielded, which means you can call and, and not even uh, disclose your identity. The Taiwo, matter will Taiwo, be I, I need to interject and, and ask the law you is this. There. How many people are aware of such laws? So what I think is that the real deterrence is a massive, massive, massive level of advocacy that we are, we are seeing right now. Taiwo, um, I, I needed to in, um, ask you this. There is a psychological aspect to this that we don't seem to know. And there's this thing people talk about conditioning. Um, some children, this, the only reason we're hearing about this and we see some is either the ch child gets pregnant or eventually speaks up. But we know that there are instances where this goes on for years, unreported. There are instances where these young children have children for their fathers. So it... What are some of the signs outside advocacy that parents, society should look out for um, to help find these children? Because like you rightly noted, they are minors. They don't have the capacity to give consent on issues like this before it happens. So what are some of the signs? I know it's a tricky question, but is there something we can well, do well, to the, find the, the, them? The signs, are not, the signs are not difficult to 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 identify, and that is still part of advocacy, to teach teachers, neighbors, what they should look out for. Now, a child can become withdrawn. You can see a child that this child is active, is withdrawn, or this child is a quiet child but has become hyperactive. You can see when a, you can see when a child is not happy. And now there are instances where teachers have studied their children because they know their pupils. And they were able to identify that something is wrong, even though the child has not said anything. Now, I've lost, I've lost count of how many cases like that where it is the teacher or the mother or the neighbor that studies the child and sees that something is missing, something is amiss. And on the basis of that, begins to probe the child, begins to ask questions. On the basis of that, the child is able to speak up. It is still part of advocacy. In Lagos State, DSDRT says, if you see something, say something. If you say something, do something, make sure something is done. So we have to be on the lookout. You know, uh, for us to be able to smell at, uh, abuse, countless miles away, we have to be on the lookout. You know, and that problem is this. When a child is being abused by the father or, or, or by the mother, because it can be either way, one of the problems is there is hardly an adult that the child can count on. Now, a child is being abused by the father. He cannot go to the mother. There are hundred cases where mothers want to protect their marriage and they know that their, their, their daughter is being abused by their father. You know, things are happening. And, and for me, it is time memorial. I lost my virginity at the age of six. That's year I started primary school. Now, the, as it was then, I couldn't speak to my parents. My parents did not talk to me about my sexual, did not talk to me about my sexuality. So I suffered in silence from age six to eight. And, and, and you see, my father died at the age of 82 in 2009. My mother died at the age of 67. I was 39 years old. They never heard my story. So, so how so can this set of victims... Um, about what I went let, let, let so me, the foundational let, thing is, it still goes back to advocacy and changing this culture of silence in society, getting people to speak up. But again, what is the social welfare available to a child who speaks up? Yeah, the there, there's an aspect I want to talk to you to about, Taiwo. Taiwo, Taiwo. These are fundamental issues. There is a, an aspect that you mentioned that I want to talk to you about. You talked about the trauma that you went through. Um, before we talk about other um, support system for other victims, which I'd like you to respond, um, suggest, how did you manage to come out of this and still be um, a well-rounded adult? Well, I've gone through some. I was, I was abused. As a child, I became we what and as an adult and my, my change actually happened in 1997 when i was 27 years old i met christ i gave my life to christ 
and I began to study scripture. And that is the foundation. I began to go through scriptural therapy. That is the foundation of my transformation. And so between the 27, I got married at the age of 36, and God helped me to be able to abstain from sex. I've been married for 14 years, no scandal. Now, I'm not saying no temptation, but I'm saying no scandal. So what I mean by that is that now, the kind of help that I found is found in spiritual help. And it is, it is potent. It is, it is, I have also helped so many other people in that process. Now, there, is, there are also professional help, psychosocial, there's so, so, psychosocial support. There is um, a therapy and all of that. Now, now, the one fundamental thing we must understand is that abuse does not leave a child the way it meets him or her. The impact of abuse is eternal, except there is either except there is divine intervention or professional intervention. But what will happen at the end of the day again is this. I think the pain is forever. Because when something that is important to you is stolen from you, you know, my virginity was stolen from me, my innocence was stolen from me, and I, I, I look back these days and, 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 and I ask the question, where were the people that were supposed to protect me to ensure that it did not happen to me? Because when a child is abused, there are three culprits. The first one is the person who's supposed to protect the child. The second one is the person who took advantage of the, of the, of the negligence of the person who is supposed to protect the child and abuse the child. The third person is the person who is aware that the child is being abused and kept quiet. I do not want to believe that our neighbors did not suspect that something was going on between me and that lady, but nobody spoke up. So the foundational thing at the end of the day is that you cannot keep quiet about abuse. So I speak to children. If you speak to your mom, your mom does not listen. Talk to your dad. If your dad is one perpetrating the thing, if you speak to your dad, your dad does not listen. Go outside and speak to somebody. Most to rape teacher, victims to don't. Mom, most, most, most rape victims. Somebody, somebody what you cannot do is to keep silent because silence only empowers the abuse abuser, not the abused. Most rape victims don't usually get justice quickly. And in some instances, they say they lose due to a lack of evidence. We know the transient nature um, of the uh, crime. How can this be resolved or managed in a way to at least get justice? Because most people say that's the beginning of healing for most victims. Yes, just justice, justice is key. The, the sight of justice brings relief to the abused. To the abused. And also encourages the, the, the also encourages society that there's hope. Now, now again, it goes to the, the the commitment of the state to put in place the judicial machinery. You know what has happened in Lagos State? Lagos State has created a special of sexual offenses court, which has accelerated trial and helped helped uh, victims to get justice. Sorry, I, I don't want to use the word victim. Affected people to get justice, you know, early. This is, we need to duplicate this kind of things in other states of the Federation. We need to duplicate it, duplicate it in Abuja, in different other places. If we have special courts that can attend to matter that has to do with sexual offenses, it was already the process. If there's advocacy to tell people what to do with evidence, you know, uh, uh, and how to preserve it, and how to report it immediately, because some of these things are transcend, and our and our forensic technology in Nigeria is still at the teaching stage or at the toddler toddler stage. So, it comes to advocacy, it comes to support system for people to speak up, because until people speak up, the the, uh, the judiciary is not, the police will not prosecute, and, and the minister of justice will not prosecute. The judiciary is not coming. Then again, to have support system to support people to go through trial. Because you go to the lower court, lower court cancels, you know, reject your case. You need to summon courage to be able to go to the to the to the appellate court. These are these are things that someone will need a lot of support. Remember, there is a level of trauma, there is a culture of silence already. So somebody is already speaking up, is already in danger. And then by the father, he or she was abused. And then by the father, he or she is speaking up. I know, I know we, we can go on on this subject all day, but we have to wrap things up now. Thank you very much, Taiwa Kinlami, for joining us on the news and uh, being very, very open about your experience and advice on what to do. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, madam. Have a nice day. You too, sir.